Father, bless us now as we preach the gospel. May we deliver your word with power and authority. In Jesus' name, amen. Reasons to stay in the kingdom. Reasons. When you read the book of 2 Peter, by the time he penned this book, and there's been uh, in theological circles debates as to whether or not the apostle Peter himself wrote 2 Peter. Some argue that due to certain things that he mentioned, that the dating wouldn't necessarily line up with his, with his lifespan. Peter was martyred, it is believed, somewhere approximately in 68 A.D. Some believe that perhaps a student of his, which was a common thing during that time, wrote a book and out of honor to him, assigned his name to it. Um, but I believe, as I have studied, that Second Peter was indeed written by the Apostle Peter himself. Um, interesting little note that the book of Second Peter was the last book in the New Testament to be canonized. The dispute uh, kept, delayed its canonization. And um, it was, it's just a jewel that God prevailed uh, and, and, uh, and that this, this gem of a book was included in scripture. By the time he writes this book, he's, he's old. And what a life, what a life this man has lived. You, it would be easy to envy the life of the apostle Peter as a fisherman by trade, young Jewish man, businessman. Um, he met Jesus. And after he met the Lord, the Lord said to him and his brother as they were fishing, um, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they dropped their nets and began to follow Jesus Christ. And I don't know if they had a clue. I would argue that they didn't, uh, that they didn't have a clue what they signed up for that they were about to be a part of the world literally changing. That this man who they called the Messiah was actually the Messiah. And that for the next three years, which would affect the rest of their lives, they would see things experience things, um, go through things that, to say the least, were extraordinary. Jesus kept such a pace that at one point John writes and said that the people thought, uh, and the Bible tells us, that the people thought that he was mad and beside himself and begged him to slow down. He finally told his disciples one day, he said, look, guys, there's been much going and much coming. Hey, take your leisure. Take a break. Because he understood keeping up with him. Oh, that, 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 that required something. Because everywhere Jesus went, things happened. Praise the Lord. The sick was healed. The dead was raised. My God, crowds followed them. And, uh, you know, sometimes the, the, the dilemma with the crowd was how to, how to feed them. And, uh, uh, and, and sometimes the crowd was so vast that he'd make them, uh, would block them off and have them to sit down in, in groups and, and put Peter and the rest of the disciples to work as they distributed food that Jesus supernaturally produced as he prayed. 
What a thing to see. When tax time came along, he told them, go down to the river and uh, look in the fish's mouth and you'll have your tax money. And, oh, boy. Huh? <laughs> I sure could use a little bit of that today. But on the other hand, we've just experienced the largest tax cut in perhaps the U.S. history, and that's a wonderful thing. Amen. If you're not clapping now, you'll clap when you get more money. More of your, more of your money is coming back. I know it's dubbed a, a rich man's tax cut, but you'll see. Um, um, and, I, and I thank God for that. Um, I mean, they saw demons cast out. Okay, keep in mind, Peter... Peter was a fisherman. He was not, uh, he was not a, a priest. He was not a, a rabbi. He hadn't been to rabbinical school. He wasn't trained that way. He was trained to be a, a businessman. And yet he saw the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan clash. He was there when Jesus stood and preached and said, a man cannot bind another man's house. Cannot come into another man's house and take over except you bind the strong man first. And Jesus declared, I've stepped into the devil's house and I have bound him. He see, he, he witnessed men with withered hands, with a withered hand, hand be restored. And Jesus uh, healed and visited Peter's mother-in-law and, and set foot in her house. They walked with him, and one day when our Lord knew he was just a few months from the cross, he stopped his disciples and said to them, took them to a place called Caesarea Philippi, Caesar's town Philippi. And where he stood, it's interesting, he stood with the backdrop from where he was standing was the city of Caesarea Philippi, and Caesarea Philippi was a beautiful, glimmering city filled with magnificent statues and images to false gods. So with all these beautiful statues of false gods in the background, he looks at his disciples and says, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, and they all got it wrong. People are saying that you're Jeremiah, you're Elijah, you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus looked at them and said, well, who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And he received a tremendous commendation and blessing from the Lord. The Lord says, blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that you, your name is Peter, but I, uh, Simon, but I call you Peter. I call you a rock. And upon this rock, you, you're going from being a little stone to a big stone. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter had tremendous highs and he had lows. One of his uh, big problems was he was talkative. And at times he would speak out of turn and would get rebuked for it. I mean, he just grabbed Jesus one day. The Lord says, I'm going to Jerusalem and they're going to kill me. Peter grabbed him and said, no way. Uh-uh, that's not going to happen. Jesus said, looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. For thou sayest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Yeah, a very low place for Peter was when he denied the Lord. He got overconfident. The Lord was teaching them and says, it's written tonight they're going to smite the shepherd and the sheep are going to scatter. The rest of the disciples listened. Peter said, Lord, not me. Mm -mm. I'll die with you before I leave you. Jesus looked at him and said, you know what? Before the cock crows, Tonight, you're going to deny me three times. And it happened. You remember, Peter, when Jesus wanted to wash the disciples' feet? 
and and which you know no you know Peter was a man now. He, was, he was a man's man he was a man he, and, 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 and 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 no Jewish male would wash another man's feet nor would any Jewish male allow a Jew to wash his feet that was the work of a slave so Peter was actually honoring the Lord and said, oh no, you're not going to wash my feet. And the Lord said, well, if I wash thee not, you have no place in me. I won't have anything to do with you. Peter says, well, don't just wash my feet. <laughs> but wash my head. Wash, wash my body. Wash me. <laughs> the Lord said, no, the feet will do. <laughs> he was a colorful man. Apostle Peter. And uh, he had a streak in him. Asked the high priest. The high priest crossed Jesus the wrong way. Peter cut his ear off. Peter was aiming for his throat. But he got his ear. And Jesus told Peter, put the sword away. He that lives by the sword is going to die by it. Picked up the high priest's ear, put it on his head, healed the man. <laughs> Come on, Peter, with help like you, you're making me... I have to work harder. Yeah, he was quite a man. But by the writing of this text, he's an old man. And um, due to some things that I'm going to show you in scripture, he knew that death for him was imminent. God bless Dr. Robert Foster. He did a tremendous job this morning. And among the things that he brought out is that we really, in this day and time, have no haters. You know, everybody now preach about their haters, and I'm not worrying about those who hate me and all that. Nobody's trying to kill you. And, uh, and he talked about, he says, when you hear uh, preachers and and missionaries and people in ministry complaining. Oh, so let's have them to read the book of the martyrs. Let them read how Christians died for the faith. And they never complained about someone not speaking to them. or Somebody looking at them funny. That was the least of it. I mean, you didn't care if someone didn't speak. Uh, because they were trying to live. And they were martyred for Jesus Christ. The apostle Peter did not die of natural causes. He was martyred. He was crucified. Amen. Uh, 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 the only one of the original 12 who died of natural, natural causes was John, the writer of St. John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the book of Revelations. And they tried to martyr him. They dipped him in boiling oil. And God let him survive that. All of the rest were put to death for the faith. Peter had a request. He says, if you, when you martyr me, if you choose crucifixion, I, I just have one request. My request is not that you do not crucify me. I'm ready for that. Go on and do what you got to do. But just do this for me. Uh, hang me upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified right side up because that's the way my Lord was crucified. Oh, how different they were then than we are now. We're spoiled. We're pampered. We're weak. We're self-centered. Oh my, as Christians, as Christians, I wonder, I wonder if uh, the crowd wouldn't increase if the saints were called upon to give their lives for the gospel. We probably, the next Sunday, we'd have more people because no one would do it. We'd, we'd try to find a way to deny the faith. We try to find a way to say, well, God understands. The Lord knows my heart as we deny him. He writes to the saints who had like precious faith. And he says to them, and uh, for, for the, the Bible students who are here, um, Peter now is um, in his pastoral role. Verse 12 is pastoral care. He says, wherefore I will not be negligent 
to put you always in remembrance. Good pastoral preaching is the type of preaching that causes us to preach the same thing over and over and over. Many times we try not to be redundant, but redundancy is necessary because our attention spans are so short. And it's so easy now for believers to forget. We don't retain nearly as much of the faith that we ought to. We can't hardly remember a scripture, but we can wrap Jay-Z's whole album. It's amazing. We, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing what we can retain versus what we can't retain. And, 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 and the retention, where we, where we see this drop in retention... Is when trouble comes. Many of us don't go through. Like we remember. What was preached. Last week. I'm amazed at the number of people. Who need counseling. Immediately after service. When we just finished preaching. God is able. How many of us handle death. Bible says that we're not to rejoice like those who have not this hope. We're not to sorrow, excuse me, like those who have not this hope. We, we behave as though we've forgotten the, that the scripture says, and that doesn't mean that you won't cry, but there should be a limit. We behave as though we've forgotten that the scripture says to be absent from the body yes, is to be present with the Lord. Our marriages struggle because we pretend that we don't know the meaning of words or that we don't remember the meaning of words like subjection. It's quiet in here. Or headship. Oh my. Oh my. So to get us through, we have to keep talking about things. People ask me, why do you talk so much about abortion? Why do you talk so much? I guess homosexuality, a few years ago when they were, uh, I, I, I can't tell you how many Christians told me. Man, you can't. And, and I, 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 thought, I think the guys thought they were being smart. You can't legislate your morality. That, that's, that was a good one. You trying to legislate your morality. No, I wasn't. I was trying to keep them from legislating immorality. That's what we were trying to do. And you know what they did? They legislated immorality. They changed the definition of marriage. And, and, and that was a direct attack on our faith and a direct attack on the Bible because if you can't trust God with the definition of marriage, what else can we trust him with? If the Bible is not reliable in who should have sex with whom? Because it's, it's from the scripture we find that thou shall not lay with mankind as with womankind. See, uh, Oprah one time was, was doing a speech and she says, we got to get, get, uh, get rid of, we got to destroy, get rid of words like abomination. Well, where do you find that word? You find that word in the Bible. She was saying we got to get rid of the Bible. It amazes me the number of Christians who seem to have forgotten the faith. I had a preacher tell me one time, Brother Wooden, I think we need to have a conference to go back and take another look and see what the Bible has to say about this subject of homosexuality. I said, I don't. And if you do, I'm not going to participate in that because I know what it says. And Negro, you know what it says. You don't need no conference for that. You know, new revelation. The Bible is right. God says to Jeremiah, uh, when you was, I think it's before you was in your mother's womb. Before. I knew thee and ordained thee a prophet. Psalms 139, uh, David describes being 
fashioned in his mother's womb. And you know what he says? He says that uh, while I'm being made in my mother's womb, God writes, wrote a script for my life. And see, I, I believe this. I believe that happiness in life is finding the script that God wrote for you. It takes a minute to find it. Find the script where he wrote out all of your members and said, now this is what I want you to be in. Here's what I want you to do. And, and, and look how we interrupt that with a procedure that's called abortion. And there are Christians who are silent on this. Why? Why do we talk about things? Why revisit the same thing? It's what pastors do. So that you can have these things etched in your mind. Somewhere in every sermon I preach, I try to include a defense for Christianity. Without even saying that that's what I'm doing. I'm defending the faith. But what do you think I'm doing when I get up and I just say to you in my opening words, I'm so glad that I'm saved. I'm glad today that I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, we're regurgitating the faith. You know, I hear things that my mother said to me all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Wash your face. Take a bath. Brush your teeth. Here I am, 50, 56 years old. I still hear her. Brush your teeth. Another one. Say your prayers. Another one. Uh, did, did you say the blessings? Yeah. Hadn't. All, then ate all the... Have almost finished breakfast. But she kept saying those things and 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 saying those things. But they're a part of me now. You remember what you what was put in you through route, through routine that was reinforced over and over and over. And, and, and the reason why some people do the things that they do is that no one reinforced things in them. Nobody, nobody told them over and over and over. It's needed in this day and time in which we live. So he says to them, I will not be negligent. I'm going to preach fast now to put you uh, always in remembrance of these things. And he says something to them, which was just wonderful in praising them a little bit. He says, though ye know them and are established in present truth. See, they had, they, they, these, these people were Gentiles. And they, they were serving false gods until they learned God's truth. And when he, when he meant present truth, that he's not talking about truth that was present at the time, but what they, the truth of God that they were brought into. Oprah doing the, I think the Golden Globes dropped some bombs the other day talking about your truth and my truth. And he's telling everybody to live their truth. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie. Don't, don't, don't let, don't bring that nomenclature into this church. I'm telling you right now, if you're preaching here, you start talking about, well, let me tell you what my truth is, and, and you live your truth. You won't finish your sentence. Mm -mm. We ain't having that. That's one overarching truth, and that's God's truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is truth? The Greek word is aletheia. It is the unveiled reality that lies at the base of a thing. When you finish pulling back all of the layers of the onion, what's left is truth. The truth is that there is one God. There is one true and living God. There is one God, one faith, and one baptism. And I want to drill this in you. I want to drill this. That's why some people say to you, oh, you go to the upper room. Oh, I know. You've been listening to that, wouldn't you? Yeah, they can tell. What was truth with me before I knew that Barack Obama was in the world stayed truth with me when he became president and when his term was closed. And it's still truth. And when he's dead and gone, 
God's truth will remain. See, when the truth has been put in you, you can't change the truth for a politician. You can't change the truth because of whatever is popular or in vogue at the time. You can't even change that truth for your girlfriend or your boyfriend, for your husband or for your wife. It gets in you. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Why? Because it's been put in there. It's, it, it's no longer what you do, it's who you are. He said, I think it right of me. As long as I'm in this tabernacle. He used the word tabernacle. Bear with me just for a few minutes. Tabernacle. Interesting word. He, he, he brings up the image of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Before Solomon built the temple in the promised land. He, the, ta the tabernacle was transferable. You could, you could set it up and you could take it down. Move from one place to another. He calls his human body, he calls himself, his body, that which houses his born-again spirit, a tent, a tabernacle that will soon be taken down. He says, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I'm going to stir you. And notice this, notice this upper room, notice this, those who are listening. He's not going to stir them by new stuff. You know, everybody now, and you, you all, listen, listen, stop being so taken by the new style, the new preacher, the new way. You know, I, we don't, you know, I don't go to a traditional church. We don't, you know, we don't go to, we, 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 we're in this new movement. You know, we, we're not into that old. Dr. Foster brought out a wonderful thing as he was showing the, the, the things about yoga and he showed all the different moves that, you know, some of y'all been doing, getting them demons in you. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, uh, he, he pointed out something. He said, you know, uh, when it's time to go to yoga, the yoga class, folk have no problem dressing for yoga. But when it's time to attend church, it's time to go to the house of the Lord. It seems like now it's a problem. And everybody now is so geared to hear something new. Oh, I don't go there anymore because, honey, child, we graduated from that. Well, Peter said, I'm going to take you right back to what you graduated from. And I'm going to remind you over and over and over. Because one thing he knew was he's going to leave them. He knew that persecution was ahead. Life has to be lived. And you don't know what's around the corner. This is why you got to get the word of God in you. And I'm glad the people to whom he was writing did not have the spirit of the Athenians and the Epicureans who were in Athens in Acts chapter 17 and, and verse 21 that says, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else uh, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's the problem. Man, have you heard this latest revelation? Have you heard this new thing? Have you heard the woke movement? I'm woke myself. I've been awake. I woke up when I met Jesus. Praise the Lord. All, all this, uh, the, these, these uh, fads that come and go. And they say some, uh, and some of you, every fad that come out, you, you ride that wave. That's why you're so confused. You don't know whether you're a man or a woman. You don't know whether you're going or coming because you're constantly trying to find some new thing so you never get settled in who God made you. I'm glad that I can stand flat-footed and say, I know in whom I believe. I know who I am in Christ. And I know that my Redeemer liveth. Do I have a witness in here? Who can shout, I know! You don't get to know changing courses every six months. Some churches, the pastor takes on a new identity. Uh, every guest he brings in. That's right. 
whatever the latest fad. They, they watch uh, CNN, uh, TBN all day and tr wait to see what the, uh, the rest of them are talking about and, and, and like you don't watch TBN. So then here they come with a new revelation and you're sitting there saying, yeah, we're watching Kenny Copeland too. Yeah, we saw T.D. Jakes. We're, we're watching them. Let me tell you something. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't watch those guys. Anything that you ever hear us preach, um, uh, that's the same. Had to have been God. Because I can't get a word from Christian TV. Mm -mm, that's, not, that's not what the Lord told me to. That's not my source. Bishop Leroy Jackson Woolard re revealed my source. My source is my spiritual dad's source. What is, what is it? Uh, Nebone Valley. And, and Prayer University. You got to get on your knees and seek the Lord and let God tell you what's next. When I finished preaching, I asked God, God, what's next? You ask me today, what are you going to preach tomorrow? I don't know. But I will when tomorrow comes. I just got to wait to see what he says. I'm spending too much time. Let me just say this. He says, I want to remind you. I want to remind you, putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle. I got to die, even as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. What, what, what did the Lord show him? In John's Gospel, chapter 21, the Lord says this to the Apostle Peter in verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girded thyself and walkest where thou wouldest. King James Version. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee where thou wouldest not. Verse 19, this he spake, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Not what death he should die, but by what death he should glorify God. That is, in his death. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. Now, the good news was that Jesus told, and Peter was a young man at this point, when the Lord said this to him, the good news was that he was going to get old. If Jesus says, when thou get old, this is going to happen, it means you're going to live to get old. So praise the Lord. He says, but as a young man, you're going to have your strength and your vigor, and you'll be able to go where you want, do what I've given you to do. Amen. You, you got your health and strength. But the day will come when that will be gone. And you'll be, you'll be an old man. And others are going to grab you and take you where you would as not. They're going to take you to, to, to a, a cross to be crucified. And he says, in your death, you're going to glorify me. Well, well, the apostle Peter saw it coming. Hallelujah. And so he says to the saints, uh, moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Now the things, let me preach to you now. The things that he's repre re representing. Notice how he represents it. He says there is something that I want you to be able to have in your remembrance that you can consult. That you can, is information that you can go back to over and over and over. Even after I'm gone. The thing that he was referencing, and it'll come into play now, uh, uh, that, that he was making reference to, it is said that Mark uh, was Peter's interpreter. Mark, who wrote the book of Mark, which literally means that when the book of Mark, St. Mark, was written, Mark got most of his information from the eyewitness accounts of the apostle Peter. So the book of Mark is filled with things that Peter told Mark as Mark walked, as Peter walked with God. And so when, and, and, and the book of Mark was one of the only New Testament books that was written at the time that Peter said this. So Peter is referring the saints to the written witness 
the word of God. And, and remember, I read to you in Mark chapter 1 where uh, Jesus came after John was put in prison. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So what he's doing is inspiring them and telling them where they can go to read and study information that will keep them pressing their way into God's kingdom. Are you following me? He says, after I'm gone, after I'm gone. See, that's one thing. Me and you know, we talked about this in the men's meeting. You know, I, I don't want upper room to exist just as long as I live. I'm working hard to set this ministry up. Now, I pray that I live a long time. But so that, 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 that when I'm gone, it can keep going. One of the greatest testimonies to James Henry Turner is that we exist today. 30 plus years after he passed away, the church marches on. When you love the Lord, you want the things that God has wrought in you to continue in people. I want my son, I want my daughter to serve the Lord. When, when the, I pray that if we live a normal lifespan, they will uh, put my body in the grave. It would disappoint me. It would, it, it would make me turn over in my grave. If after I'm gone, they walk away from Jesus. After I'm gone, they, they don't serve the Lord. I'd be highly disappointed if my grandbabies turned out to be Buddhists or Muslims or Hindus or, or anything other than Christian. Somebody shout, when I'm gone. When I'm gone, I want my family. And I want you. You wouldn't honor me if God took me today. And then you, your, your response is, well, I don't know, I, what kind of God would do that? What kind of, God? I'll tell you what kind of God, a God who decided to take me from labor to reward. A God who decided to let me see him face to face. A God who decided to let me drink from the crystal fountain that shall never run dry. I tell you what you better do, you better come go with me. Somebody shout something in here. Don't you give up on Jesus. Peter, Peter wasn't just concerned about the welfare of the saints while he was living, but he says, at, when I'm gone at my decease, I want to leave this thing where you can run, you can refer back to it and, and remember over and over. And then he begins to defend the word of God. You know, there have been so many, I got to hurry up, but yeah, I love this stuff. That's all right. <laughs> there have been so many who have tried to cast doubt on the authority of the scriptures. <laughs> but let me give you just six facts. I could give you 60, but I want to give you six. Fact number one, the Bible stakes its own authority on its claim to be the word of God. If it lies at this point. It is altogether worthless. The Bible tells us that it is the word of God. The Bible, fact number two, the Bible at no point contradicts itself. The scripture is internally consistent. Number three, the Bible's batting average for predicting future events, what we call prophecy. You know what the batting average of the Bible is? A thousand percent. Everything the scriptures have predicted, if the scripture says it's going to happen, it happens. Sometimes not in the way that we think, but the scriptures have never missed. The Jehovah's Witness have, has many times, but the scriptures have never missed. The Bible's description of its contemporary world the world that it was in, the world that the writers wrote from, the Bible the description of its contemporary world is accurate. Archaeologists and historians have looked uh, for that single find, look for that single piece of historical data that disproves the scripture. And over and over and over, what they found are proof that the Bible is true. 
Oh, there have been so many who have tried to discredit this book. Number five, the Bible does not contradict the proven truths of science. No, the Bible is not a science book, but scientific findings agree with the factual statements that are in the scripture. Well, I believe in science, not the Bible. You can't believe in science and not the Bible. And if there's any place where unproven science disagrees with the Bible, I'm going with the Bible. I'm going with God. Number six, the Bible has been kept from error over history. Hundreds of hands copied ancient texts and ancient manuscripts and, uh, and have, they, they, they've been uncovered. And some date back almost to the original, original documents. And God watched over his word to protect the accuracy of his word. You can trust with your life. You can trust with your soul. You can trust your entire being to that book that's in your lap. If, of course, that book is your Bible. And I don't know why you'd be looking at anything else right now. <laughs> the Bible is the word of God. And, and Peter says this, and Rocky don't go far. He says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of Jesus. That is, since when we, when we told you about Jesus, it wasn't from uh, cleverly contrived myths. I've heard, I've seen commercials, I've heard people speak of the Bible and other mythological books. The Bible is not myth. The Bible is the word of God. It's, it's an insult. Praise the Lord. You want to get me mad? Call it myth. We got to have a conversation. Amen. We, and, and, and if it gets heated, it gets heated. But the word of God is not myth. It doesn't belong in the fiction section of a library. Praise the Lord. Doesn't belong in the myth section. Really, it doesn't even belong in the religious section. It ought to be in its own section. Bible. We're going to D.C. We're going to D.C. to see the Bible uh, Museum. Amen. The people who own uh, Hobby Lobby spent over a billion dollars and built a museum. It's the largest one up there to the Bible. God is good. God is good. We who serve the Lord, the Bible is not filled with cleverly told lies. The Bible is the word of God. He says we didn't use cleverly told lies to, to, to uh, tell you about the power and the coming of Christ. And that here, he's not, he's not referencing our Lord's second coming. He's saying when we told you about his first advent, when he came after being born of a virgin, and when he came and, and John the Baptist looked up and said, behold, the Lamb of God. And when we talked to you about all the things that we saw him do while we walked with him, we were not telling lies. We instead he says we were eyewitnesses of his majesty and let me tell you something everybody in here ought to have I feel my help an experience with God that you, you ought to be able to call your eyewitness experience see I'm saved uh, 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 for more than one reason I'm saved because Bible is the word of God, but I didn't know that the Bible was as true as it is when I got saved. I had an experience. I didn't ask you to talk to your neighbor today, so look at your neighbor and say, something happened to me. See, now, now, if you haven't had an experience, you don't know yet, and, and, and that might be the problem, but, but, but I've had multiple but everybody ought to have, be able to go back to that, that, that particular one. And in far, the apostle Peter, he, he says here, you would think that the particular one would be him preaching on the day of Pentecost when he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Or Jesus saying to him, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Or all of the things that we've mentioned before. But what he brings up in John's Gospel chapter 9 is an experience that took place 920 feet above sea level. Oh my God. On Mount Hermon. 
Yes, sir. He, Peter, James, and John went with Jesus up on Mount Hermon and got up there. Got up there. And Jesus looked to make sure that the coast was clear. And, 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 and Peter, James, and John standing over there. And Peter said that after he got up there, he, he, he told Mark about it. Mark writes about it in chapter 9. He said that Jesus began to transfigure. In other words, all of that glory that he had in himself, that he'd been holding in, he got up on Mount Hermon and began to just let the glory out. Uh, Mark describes it this way in Mark 9 and 3 it says his raiment became shining and exceeding white as snow and as so as no fuller on earth can whiten them. He said his clothes got so white that a dry cleaner couldn't wh whiten it. It was the whitest thing and the brightest thing and the Bible says it began to shine like the sun and they looked again and there was Moses and Elijah over there with Jesus Christ and Peter said should should he should have he should stay quiet he said should we build three tabernacles one for Moses one for Elijah and one for thee and he said that he heard a voice from heaven speak from glory and said this is my beloved son hear ye him in other words God the father said shut up Peter this is my beloved son listen to him here Peter is some 50 years later getting ready to die but his mind goes back to what the Lord did for him on that day I wonder this morning is there anybody here who had, who can remember, well, I guess they call it an aha moment. You remember that experience that you had with God, that when Jesus laid his hands on you, maybe it was the day he saved you. Maybe it was the day he filled you with the Holy Ghost. Maybe it was the day he delivered you from drugs or took smoking away from you. Maybe it was a day when you were on your knees in prayer and he came in and he laid his hands on you but every one of us in here has an experience that we can go back to when the road gets rough and when the going gets tough and when the hills get hard to climb everybody in here ought to have something that you can go back to where you can tell of the devil you can tell that trial I'm not giving up because I remember when do you have that in your mind if you have it you ought to go back there now and just praise the Lord for what he did in your life Somebody, somebody wrote about their experience. They said, I was shackled by a heavy burden beneath the load of sin and shame. But then the hand of Jesus, he touched me. And now I'm no longer the same touched me he touched me and ah the joy that flood my soul do you know what I'm talking about something happened and now ah no the light Praise him in here. If you've been touched,
made me whole. That's why I say, get out of here, Muslim. Get out of here, Jehovah Witness. Get out of here, Hindu. Get out of here, Buddhist. Get out of here, LGBTQ and all the rest of them. Get out of here because I know that something happened to me. I was on my way to hell, but he picked me up and he turned me around, placed my feet on a solid foundation, and that ain't all, but he filled me with the Holy Ghost. How many have the Holy Ghost today? Don't it make a difference? Don't it? Didn't it give you joy? Can't you feel him when the storms of life get heavy and when the burden is on your back and the devil is trying to turn you around? You can't get the pastor on the phone. You can't reach the first lady. You can't reach the district missionary. But you let your mind roll back to the day, to the hour. When the law Woo! Somebody praise him in here. I think about the temple. I think about the temple. I was a child when I got saved. I was 16. Temple Church of God in Christ on Stewart Street. Sometimes when I'm going through, I just think about that place. I love all of this. And I think about that little church. Here and I again, say to myself, it was in my childhood. It was many years ago when the power of the Holy Ghost I was filled, oh yeah, in that old country wagon over the rocks and reel we go to to that little wooden church out on the hill out on the hill my mind goes back there I met Jesus in that place that's one reason why I'm staying in the kingdom the next reason that he gives is that we have a more sure word of prophecy the bible grab your bibles the bible we have this we have this we have this we have this and he says in the text and you do well you do well if you take heed to it it's like a you know what the bible is the bible is like a light that shines in a dark place the world is dark and wicked and mean and ugly the Bible shines the light the Bible lights it up the, the, people are confused until they turn to the Bible people don't know what to do until they turn to the Bible there's a whole lot of gray in the earth till you turn to the Bible it is the light that shines in a dark place. And it shines until the day star. Good God Almighty. Till the morning star, who is Jesus Christ, appears in your heart. And he says this about the authority of the scriptures. And I'm done. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. That when God gave the word of God, it was not any man's private explanation. It was not something that some human being came up with. Even the writers didn't make it up. That book you have in your lap there, you better value that thing. You better thank God that it's in existence. And you better thank God that the Lord blessed you to have one. And when you read it, 
Don't you doubt a word of it. For it was not by any private interpretation. God Almighty. Do you see that? For the prophecy came not in old time. It came not in old time or at any time by the will of man. But look at this. This gives authority even of the Old Testament and the new. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Directed by holy men, directed by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Not dictated, but directed by the Holy Spirit. People wrote in their own words, expressing through their own culture and personality the truth that God revealed unto them. And no one, no organization, no enemy, nobody, no matter how much money, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and uh, who is that other man, man I talk about a lot? Uh, Gates, Buffett. And George, yeah, George, the devil. George Soros, their money's combined. If, they, if you combine their fortune, you're talking about maybe 200 billion or more. They can spend it all trying to discredit this book. They'll never get anywhere. If you are crazy enough to let some fad take you away from Christianity, and there you go following the Zulu crowd, let me tell you something. The church will still keep marching on. Nothing will stop the move of God. You'll be lost. You'll be out of place. I tried to talk to a young man. He wouldn't listen since he's been gone. God have done glorious things as he's pursuing a cult. I've seen healings. I've seen deliverances. Young men, I've seen God move with power and authority while he has his wife, his children, his family out there in darkness, missing out on a move of God. There's not a person in here who can stop the scriptures. If I quit today, it won't put a dent in the scriptures. God's word will forever stand. He gives two reasons. He gives two reasons to stay in this gospel of the kingdom that Mark wrote about, that Peter dictated to him. Number one, personal experience. I was an eyewitness. I was there. I was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. I saw it myself. And I heard the voice speak from heaven. And you can't tell me any different because I was there. And the second reason, the word of God. The word of God. The word of God. There is no reason for you to crack under any pressure. There's no reason for you to give in to any trial. There's no reason for you to give up on God. As humans, we stumble and fall. As humans, we fall short. But, but let me tell you something. Don't you ever leave Jesus. And you thank God. You thank God for holiness. You thank God. God that you're in a church. Well, you know, sometimes I feel like all I'm hearing is the same old, same old. Shout. Because that's the way you remember it. That's the way you remember it. That's the way it becomes a part of you. Pastor, I want to go into something. No, I'm going to keep you with the fundamentals. That's what makes the patriots and teams like that better. They go back to the drawing board. They don't come with a whole lot of new stuff. Drawing board. Some of these teams tell you what we're going to do. Back in the day with Jordan and the Bulls or, or, or Bird and the Celtics, and there's a few seconds left. Here's the play. Get a ball to Bird and move out the way. <laughs> and everybody knew what was coming. Hand, give Jordan the ball and, and, and clear the way. And the, and the opposing team knew what the play was. It says, and now that you know what it is, stop it. <laughs> yes, Satan, you've read Psalms 23. You've read them all. But after having read them 
when you see the saint come armed with the word of God see if you can stop us you can't because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world where you are father in Jesus name we have reasons to stay with you Lord you touched me okay shut on somebody saying pastor but I've forgotten mine <laughs> remember it let your mind run back. It's working, it's working, it's there, it's there, it's there. It's, remember it. You're not that far removed. Remember it. Remember, remember. Remember when, when he visited you. Remember when he laid his hands on you. Remember, 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 remember. And praise him for it. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for delivering. Thank you for that touch. Thank you for my my Mount Hermon experience. I wasn't there with Peter, but then Peter wasn't there when I got mine. Hallelujah. He had his, and I have mine. He laid his hands on me, and I'm not giving that up. And then, Lord, you left me a witness that I can turn to anytime I want. I can turn to it every day. I can turn to it every hour. Oh, it's the word of God. And I thank you for the Bible. And right now, Lord, I renew my commitment and I renew my faith and I renew my love in the word of God. Hallelujah. Your word is a lamp into my feet, a light to my pathway. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, we praise you and we give you all of the glory. We give you all of the honor. We give you all of the praise. In Jesus' name. There may be someone here today who hasn't, who have never had an experience with the God of the Bible. When you hear people say, the Lord touched me. You don't know what that's like. When you say, the Lord visited me. You hear people say, the Lord visited me. Or the Lord made a way. Or the Lord did this. Or the Lord did that. You haven't experienced him personally. And see, this is not religion now. This is not an ecclesiastical thing. It's a personal thing. Ah, uh, he changed me. I didn't change when I got saved. He changed me. Then I began to go along with that. But it wasn't my doing. It was his doing. He initiates the change. Then you go with the change that he has initiated. If there's someone here today who want that change, you want the Lord to save you. You want the Lord to forgive you of your sins. You want his grace. We will give you a moment to come and we will pray with you and the Lord Jesus will save you from your sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He'll change your life. He changed my life. Oh, my God. And the funny thing about uh, my salvation is where I got saved at, Mother, I had walked past that church a hundred times. Because sometimes after school, when I didn't catch the bus, going to do mischief, I'd have to walk from Rockham Junior High and walk right past the temple. And I would go by there during the day and I would always think, this church is never open because it was around three o'clock in the afternoon. Had no idea in that little white building, my whole life would change. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. Father and I, we just thank you we thank you for everything Lord 
Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your keeping power. In Jesus name. Lord. We have reasons. To stay in the kingdom. We are pressers. In Jesus name. Amen. Everybody who's born again. Clap your hand. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. Everybody, he made.